Roughly 13.8 billion years ago, the fabric of space-time came into existence and marked the beginning of our physical universe as we know it. Although initially many scientists rejected this theory as unscientific, the evidence piled up and firmly established it as a scientific fact. Our universe appears to have come into existence from nothing. Despite the logical absurdity of nothing being able to produce something, some physicists have decided to embrace the idea, like Lawrence Krauss. In his book, he argues that scientifically speaking, a universe could come into existence from nothing. But the amazing thing is, once you apply, in fact, quantum mechanics to gravity, as you were beginning to allude again in the last uh, segment, then it's possible, in fact, it's implied that space itself can be created where there was nothing before, that literally whole universes can pop out of nothing by the laws of quantum mechanics. And, the, and in fact, the question, why is there something rather than nothing then becomes sort of trite because nothing is unstable, it will always produce something. The more interesting or surprising question might be, why is there nothing? But of course, if we ask that question, well, we wouldn't be here. Krauss and other atheists who agree with him say the universe doesn't need a creator because according to the laws of quantum mechanics, it can just come into existence from nothing. Nothing, meaning a lack of space, time, and matter, is unstable and produces things easily and often, thereby meaning there is no outside creator needed because the universe essentially can create itself, or an unstable nothing will produce the universe. However, despite this achievement in creativity, fellow physicists and philosophers have noticed several problems with this hypothesis. The most obvious being, this is not a scientific explanation of an actual nothing producing something, but a hypothesis that unstable fluctuations in a quantum state could produce space, time, and matter. All skeptics have done is reinterpret these quantum fluctuations as an absolute nothing because it lacks any matter or space-time. But that is not an explanation of how absolutely nothing could produce something, but a hypothesis of how quantum information could produce space-time and matter. All skeptics are doing is drawing from a phenomenon that happens in physics, where fluctuations of energy contained in a vacuum produce virtual particles. But prior to the creation of space-time, no space existed which would be needed to contain such a vacuum. So the same natural processes could not be responsible for creating our physical universe. One would have to infer a timeless quantum flux of information without energy or a vacuum would need to occur to begin space-time. But still, this is not an absolute nothing. In reality, an actual nothing is not only the absence of space-time and matter, but quantum states, laws of physics, and information. And by definition, an actual nothing cannot produce something. This skeptical response represents, I believe, a deliberate abuse of science. The theories in question have to do with particles or the universes originating as a fluctuation of the energy contained in the vacuum. The vacuum in modern physics is not what laymen understand by vacuum, namely nothing. Rather, in physics, the vacuum is a sea of fluctuating energy governed by physical laws and having a physical structure. To tell laymen that on such theories something comes from nothing is a distortion of those theories. This game of semantics doesn't show how the universe could come from a real nothing. So this is an equivocation fallacy, since the definition of nothing doesn't mean quantum information without space, time, or matter, but a literal nothing even lacking information. As physicist Don Page says, even though I am a scientist rather than a philosopher or a theologian, on this issue, I agree with them and think that the idea of nothing as the absence of anything not logically necessary is much more precise and well-defined than Krauss's imprecise ideas of nothing, such as the absence of space and time itself. If space and time are emergent properties, how does one define precisely their absence? But the real issue with this must be addressed. Far from the belief this idea will replace the need for a creator, the idea of a quantum state producing the universe has not only been argued to be likely, but has strong theistic implications. If this view proposed by Krauss is correct, then we must accept our physical universe, space-time, came into existence from spaceless quantum fluctuations. And therefore, we must accept the physical universe is not fundamental, but emergent from an underlying reality that is more fundamental than the physical.
meaning there is a nature more fundamental than the physical universe or space-time. And the physical is a mere emergent effect of this underlying fundamental nature. In other words, the physical universe would be sort of like a hologram or illusion produced only by underlying information processes. And despite the naysayers, this is what research into quantum gravity and quantum mechanics reveals. Space-time is a contingent and emergent effect of underlying quantum information processes. The, the future, at least of, of this development, will be that we start actually with information. So information is going to be our starting point. Uh, and space-time is not something that we start with. Uh, we, we, we forget about what space is and what time. Uh, and then somehow the information, by thinking about how much information is what information is doing, then the space-time will what we call be emergent. It will come out of just a bunch of zeros and ones. One possibility to get for a, quant to a quantum theory of gravity is that space-time is not fundamental. Um, that space-time is, if you like, an effective emergent description from something else. So recent experiments led by a group at the University of Vienna, Austria, provide the most compelling evidence yet that there is no objective reality beyond what we observe. So it's really the observation that creates the reality. And what they found is that Leggett's inequality is violated as well as Bell's. Even if you allow for instantaneous influences, quantum measurements do not fit with the idea of an objective reality. Who deserves to trust their intuition more than Einstein? And Einstein's intuition told him, like everybody's intuition tells them, that things are really there when you're not looking at them. Well, he was wrong, right? <laughs> you know, th that intuition is incorrect. What we perceive as reality now depends on our earlier decision what to measure which is a very, very deep uh, message about, about the nature of reality and about our role in the universe. We are not just passive observers. The evidence is piled up and the conclusions are shared by researchers in quantum gravity. Space-time appears to be nothing but an emergent effect of underlying information processes. But where could this information come from? If there was no space prior to the Big Bang, from which fluctuations contained in a vacuum could possibly produce matter, then would obviously have to come from something else. And if there is no matter to form computer-like substances to perform information processing, and no time for natural processes to play out, we are left with few options. Furthermore, the implications of a physical universe coming from a pseudo-nothing, or information, should not scare any theists, but simply cohere with our worldview. This idea is not a threat to those who identify as Christians, for our own scriptures cohere with this idea the universe was created by underlying information. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God, so that what was seen was not made out of things that are visible. Psalm 33.9 says, For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. And Genesis 1 recounts how God spoke creation into existence. And what is spoken word if not information? But let's return to our question. What is the cause of this information processing? If there are no computer-like substances due to a lack of matter, it could not be physical. But if there is no space, there would be no vacuums containing quantum fluctuations from which an unstable pseudo-nothing could produce matter. And if there is no time, there are no naturalistic processes which could play out. Thus, if this theory turns out to be true, and the conclusions in quantum mechanics and quantum gravity research suggest they are, we are left with an immaterial, spaceless, timeless cause of the universe an immaterial cause that can also process information and cause other things to come out of that information on its own. Given these conditions, the only clear option we are left with is none other than an immaterial mind who spoke or thought the universe into existence, which is essentially information creation. No other logical option can account for these conditions, and modern science has finally caught up with what theists have been telling us for thousands of years conclusion realized decades ago by physicist Max Planck. As a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about the atoms this much. There is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force, which brings the particles of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. Whenever we talk about reality, even think about reality, we really handle information. The two are not separable. So maybe now this is speculative here, 
Maybe the two are the same, or maybe even information is constitutive to the universe. And this reminds me of the beginning of uh, the Bible of St. John, which starts with, in the beginning was the Word. And I know that this is not the only uh, tradition in the world which says that. And so one of the first non-physicists that I talked to, or that I, I read, reflected on my comment, said effectively, and this is, this is not exact words, but effectively he said, if the simulation hypothesis is valid, then we open the door to eternal life and resurrection and things that formerly have been discussed in the realm of religion. And the reason is really quite simple because if you think about a computer, if we are a simulation, then we're like programs in a computer. As long as I have a computer that's not damaged, I can always rerun the program, right? So if you really believe that we are in a simulation and there's some structure that runs that simulation, unless something damages that structure, then we are repro we, you know, we can be repurposed. And so it starts to break down a very funny barrier between the, what people often think is the conflict between science and the conflict between faith. So far from being a problem for theists, Lawrence Krauss only puts forward an idea that coheres with scripture and points us back to an immaterial mind as the cause of the universe. Thus, if the universe came from nothing, as defined by Krauss, then far from replacing the need for a creator, this conclusion actually takes us right back to one. As Robert Jastrow said in 1978, for the scientist who has lived by faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulled himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been there for centuries.